Day 39 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, today we are in Exodus chapters 28 through 29, where God is going to raise up his ministers or his priests who would care for the tabernacle and also intercede on behalf of the people before God. But before we get started, if you could please partner with us by hitting that like button, letting us know that you love God's word, you love digging a little bit deeper and getting into the nitty gritty of it. And also if you believe that this could be helpful to somebody else, if you are new here, we welcome you. Please let us know where you are watching from and how you found this Bible study. And if you have any questions, at all, please make sure to check out either the show notes or the description box, or you can always go to our website, heartdive.org, where there's lots of information there about this Bible study. We will be reading today from the ESV translation by Crossway. And if you have been thinking to yourself, I sure wish she would talk a little bit slower or boy, I sure wish we could slow this thing down. Well, guess what? You can. There is actually a setting on your end where you can slow down the video so that I am talking a little bit slower. And I will assure you that it's going to sound like I have a Southern accent, <laughs> which is a good thing. I love me a good Southern accent. Or if you're one of those who's like, she just talks way too much. There's also a fast forward button. So great things in the world of technology, wouldn't you say? Hey, let's go ahead and pray and prepare ourselves. There is a lot of meat into today's reading today. I'm excited for it. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time, for this family, for all of these new friends that we have, Lord. We don't take it for granted that you have placed every single person by divine purpose at the exact time that you intended for them to come across these videos, for them to come together to be able to read your word, to dig a little bit deeper, to grow our relationship with you. So we submit ourselves before you in humility today to be able to hear your word, to hear your voice, expecting fully that you will speak to us personally. And so I pray that you'll clear out the junk out of our ears. I pray that you will let the scales fall off of our eyes and let the hardness of our heart begin to soften so that when you plant seeds, God, you are able to nourish them, water them. They're able to grow roots and bear fruit. Thank you for the honor of being one of your children. We're so grateful for it. I pray that you will please forgive us of our sins, Lord. May we wash ourselves by the blood of the Lamb. I pray that our consciences will be clear today, Lord, so we can just be before you with innocence and purity and righteousness. But Lord, we thank you so much that it is by your grace that we are saved, that we are forgiven, and we're so grateful for it. Please help us to also extend that to other people in forgiving them as well. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting off here in chapter 28, then bring near to you Aaron, your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. So serving God would have been their first priority as priests. The second priority is then serving the people. And a lot of the times in ministry, we can get that mixed up. We can get that backwards. And that's why you see a lot of burnout among pastors because they are serving the people first and God second. So Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar, because remember the priests were coming from the tribe of Levi. And that's exactly where Aaron and Moses came from, from specifically Kohath. And so we see how God uses families in ministry. I mean, anyone linked to the family of Aaron would carry this greater responsibility of entering into the priesthood. Well, guess who we are linked to? The great high priest. So we are called a royal priesthood. Therefore, we are all called into the ministry. But this doesn't necessarily mean that everyone becomes ministers in an organized institution. I mean, we are ministers in our homes, we're ministers in our workplaces, or in the way that we treat the wait staff or the person who checks us out at the grocery store. So, heart check. What are you doing with your role in the royal priesthood? And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and beauty. And I thought, gosh, that's amazing. You know, everything that God does is for glory and for beauty. He cares about both of those things. You shall speak to all these skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments. Now, this is cool. We have all been given specific skills and gifts by God. And you will hear me drive this one into the ground over and over because I'm passionate about it. I mean, I truly believe that whenever we get this, when we understand that our gifts are skills, our abilities are all intended to fit together in God's purpose for our lives because we are created for His glory. And that includes those gifts that He has instilled in us from before we were even formed in our mother's wombs. Now, if you don't know what those things are, 
ask him. If you don't know how to use them for his purpose, ask him. Because the Holy Spirit loves to empower those who seek his guidance and his wisdom. So heart check. What skills or abilities do you feel that you have been divinely gifted with? And how are you using them to minister to the Lord? And He will call you in those abilities and in those gifts. He will call you to use those things. And I remember one of my friends used to tell me that her biggest fear was that God was going to call her to be a missionary in the middle of a desert somewhere, and that it was going to be this horrible suffering experience because that's simply His will for her life. And I was like, girl, while we may sometimes go through those hard times or those seasons of suffering, that is in God's will and purpose for your life. I mean, His purpose is a beautiful thing. It is to prosper you, not to harm you. So we got to remember that, you know, he will call you in those skills. So it's good for us to take inventory of what those things are. So these are the garments that they shall make a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. So notice that the materials that will be used to create these garments are the same as the tabernacle, and that is because the priest, of course, is linked to the church or to the place of worship. And they shall make the ephod of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and of fine twined linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven Band on it shall be made like it, and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this outer piece here is the ephod of which we were talking about. And I have not glued this in yet. I'll show you guys really quickly how I do this. All I do is just take a glue stick like this, rub it along the edge. Sorry, I know I'm distracting from the work, but I know some people have been wanting to know how we do this. And it's just simple. I just throw it right here into the spine, close it up smash it down and pretty much good to go. That's it. Easy peasy. Am I worried about it falling out? Well, it's better than a sticky note that's going to pop off anyway. Now, an ephod spoke of authority. And of course, that points us to looking at Christ as the authoritative one. And so I always ask myself, do I got my ephod on today? Do I got my Jesus on today? When I walk out the door, we got to be putting on our Jesus before we do anything. And you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. So the two stones of onyx that would be surrounded by gold would be right here on the two shoulders. And while we're going to see in a moment where each one of the tribes has its own gemstone, which is going to symbolize their uniqueness as the tribes and children of Israel, we're also seeing here in the two onyx stones, a commonality between them, just as it is in the church where we have all these denominations, all these faiths right here in this ministry, by the way. I mean, we've got all kinds of people in here, but the commonality is that we love of Jesus. We know He died for us. We know He paid the price. We know we are saved by grace and not works. We know that He's going to be coming back one day for us. And that's a beautiful thing. And we should all, as the church, one church, one people, be pointing others to that. That's the main thing. That's our main job. But really, a lot of people spend more time trying to tear one another down instead of pointing to Jesus. But getting back to these onyx stones, if you've ever heard that saying, carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, this would be a fine example of that. I mean, the priest would wear these stones on his shoulders as an act of remembrance for the sons of Israel. He bore the responsibility of carrying their sins to the altar and making atonement for them. And guess who did the heaviest of lifting whenever he bore the weight of the entire world on his shoulders? And while we are set free from carrying any extra weight or burdens of our own because of that, we can still help to ease that weight off of others. We can do it through prayer, through edification, through teaching, through encouragement. So heart check, what load are you bearing on your shoulders for others?
So we'll continue here. And Aaron shall bear the names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. And you shall make a breast piece of judgment in skilled work. In the style of the ephod, you shall make it of gold and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, you shall make it. So it's really hard to see here, but this would be a little hanging breast piece that would hang around his neck. And of course, having all all of these jewels on it, which we will read about now. It shall be square and double a span its length and a span its breadth. So one span would have been the length from the tip of the thumb to the tip of the pinky finger. So that is about nine inches of a man's hand. You shall set it in four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz, carbuncle shall be the first row and the second row an emerald a sapphire and a diamond and the third row a jacinth an agate and an amethyst and the fourth row a beryl an onyx and a jasper they shall be set in gold filigree there shall be 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. You shall make for the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold, and you shall make for the breastpiece two rings of gold and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And you shall put the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the two cords you shall attach to the two settings of the filigree, and so attach it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. You shall make two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge next to the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and attach them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod so that the breastpiece shall not come loose from the ephod. Now, I know this is going over a lot of people's heads, and that is okay. It's just important to understand that God laid out very specific instructions for the Israelites to carry out. And we'll see how it all comes together in the end. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. So with the names of the tribes being engraved on each one of these stones, that means it was permanent. There's no taking it back. There's no dry erase marker or even Crayola washable marker that's going to get washed away. They are under covenant with God forever. And it's just the same way with us. Like when we are saved by the blood of Jesus, the Bible says that we are engraved in the palms of his hands. There's no take backs there. We're written in the Lamb's book of life with a Sharpie marker. The only only way that we will get blotted out is if we walk away from God. And with it saying that it is written on his heart, this depicts the love of Christ. And it is a reminder of the solemn responsibility that the priest has to be able to represent the entire nation before God. And if he doesn't do that, anything less will be prone to divine judgment. And in the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. So the high priest would have been in charge of settling disputes, especially spiritual matters. And apparently they would use this Urim and Thummim. Some say that they were two different colors and they would almost act as like flipping a coin but without chance, because that's left to chance. This was actually divine decision using the Urim and the Thummim, that whatever came out, that would be the answer as spoken by God. And so Urim means lights. Now, the Greek translation of that is truth. Thummim means perfections in Hebrew. The Greek translation of that would be manifestation. So in this Urim and Thummim, we have lights and perfection truth and manifestation. So what this would do was allow them to see the true light in a perfect way. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. So here we see the robe underneath the ephod. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening, like the opening in a garment, so that it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe, and it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, 
so that he does not die. So since the priests would, quote, disappear from the people whenever he would go into the tabernacle, the people would know that he is still ministering on their behalf by the sound of the bells. They would hear it as he entered in, but also as he exited. And then I thought to myself, well, we can sometimes have a distinct sound going into church that sounds a whole lot different than that sound we make at home or as soon as we step foot into our cars. For some of us, that sound changes again whenever we get with our friends. So heart check. Is the sound of your spirit the same when it comes out of the holy place as it is going in? And if we look at the symbolism of the pomegranate, well, if you think about a pomegranate, the inside of it is blood red. It has the most seeds, I believe, of any fruit. And of course, it is a fruit. So whenever we translate that spiritually, of course, the blood of being shed on the cross, which then led to the impartation of the Holy Spirit, with, of course, the fruit of the Spirit being love and a whole lot of things that flow from it, and then the seeds being us, the people who are going to be fruitful and make disciples of all nations. And so, when keeping that in mind, now we look at the bells. I believe it was John Corson who says this speaks of the gifts of the Spirit or the spiritual gifts. And if you look at the way those are laid out in the Bible, you've got spiritual gifts or gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, with the fruit of the Spirit being in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right in the middle of the bells which is exactly the layout on the hem of this robe. And if you think about God's purpose of this, I mean, we could have spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts, and they could just clang together. And what is it going to be? Resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. But if you have a gift here and a gift here, and you've got love right in between that, that is where everything fits together and it's going to flourish. And one of the issues we will see later on is that some of these priests would have these really long tassels and loud bells so that when they would walk through the streets, Everybody knew who they were and they would ooh and awe at them and they felt powerful and they had all of this authority and there is going to be a rebuke for that. But for right now, that was the purpose because of course, anything that God lays out for us can easily be polluted by us. And this is one of those things that will happen. Verse 36, you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord, and you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue." It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And so again, this is that symbol that he is bearing the guilt from the people and bringing it to the Lord. Anything that they consecrate as a holy gift, he takes on that guilt and he brings it before the Lord. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, was holy because he was simply without sin. And sin is the first thing that's going to break down our holiness. You know, it erodes, it steals from us, it destroys, it kills. And people who are living in that life of sin think otherwise. They think they are living their best life or having fun. But we've got to realize, you know, holiness isn't a life of being a prude. Holiness actually is the ticket to truly being happy. Because when you're living your life seeking after righteousness, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those are the ones who are going to be filled by the Lord. And when you're filled by the Lord, that is that filling up of that source of joy. So if you've ever wondered why you're not happy, that might be one area to look at. I'm not saying that if you're unhappy, it's because you're sinning and living in a life of sin, but it's definitely one place to look and take inventory and make sure, hey, is there something that I haven't dealt with? Verse 39, you shall weave the coat in checkerwork of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. Now, a coat speaks of salvation and righteousness, the linen being a fabric of righteousness, the fine linen then being a fabric of perfection. And of course, with righteousness and perfection, that points us again to Jesus. Now, thank God we are given robes of righteousness whenever we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We don't have to work our way or do any of these rituals in order to get there. It's a free gift to us given by grace. And so the moment we become believers, the Father now sees the Son and His robes wrapped around us. Verse 40, for Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. And caps, speaking of submission, they still wear those caps on their heads today in the Jewish faith. You shall make them for glory and beauty, and you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests." 
you shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. So, of course, this would be to protect their modesty as a high priest. And this would have been really countercultural back then because, again, they're surrounded by pagan sexual practices all over the place. But for us, spiritually, the undergarments speak of our character. I mean, whatever is underneath all of this outward stuff is really truly what is important to God. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. So if you didn't know all of this before and what it symbolized and what the purpose of it was, I think this is really cool, especially for those in the Catholic faith or other faiths where the ministers wear this type of garments, for you to look at it and see the beauty behind it and what God intended for it. And so they were to wear these things at all times while ministering, lest they bear guilt and die. And unfortunately, there will be some who do end up dying. So this was a huge responsibility to do everything as the Lord commanded. Chapter 29, now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them. And your translation may say hallow or to make them holy. And that, of course, that means just to set aside for his purpose. That's what consecration is. And that's what we're doing here. That they may serve me as priests. So remember, the service is to God first, people second. And the main service that they're going to be doing is in the tabernacle, in the places that are hidden from the people anyway. So really, the most important service that we do to God is the unseen things, what is taking place whenever nobody else can see you. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. Now, remember during the Passover with the unleavened bread, that was intended to represent the haste in which they would have to leave Egypt. But here, this leaven is representing sin. So that is why they were using unleavened bread and not leavened bread. You shall make them a fine wheat flour and you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. So this would have been a public ritual. Everybody's going to see what's going on. And so it would have been a pretty humbling experience to be washed in front of everybody. But baths at this time were actually a rare luxury in the desert. So you could probably imagine how stinky everybody actually really was. But it was necessary for the priests to be clean before the Lord as an outward expression of what was going on on the inside. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil, pour it on its head and anoint him. So we're not just dabbing a little bit of anointing oil here on your forehead. They are pouring it on. This is in great measure. And remember, the meaning of Messiah actually means anointed one. So it's all coming together to make sense to point to the great high priest in Jesus. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them and you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. So ordain, you could have the translation consecrate. Ordain actually means to fill one's hands. So this is basically empowering them spiritually for this service. It's kind of like the way that a king would be given a rod, and this would symbolize the power that he now has over the people. But of course, again, this is a spiritual authority that they are being given here. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of the meeting. Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. So their laying of the hands on the bull, usually by the horns, would be symbolic of them transferring all of their sin to this sacrificial animal, designating this animal as a substitute for them. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. And the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. And the reason why they would have to burn all of these things outside the camp is because these are the things that would not be suitable for sacrifice to the Lord. And when you hear about burnt offerings, you always hear that there's this sweet aroma or pleasant aroma that goes up to the Lord. 
Now, the burning of these things in particular would have put off a pretty stinky stench to our human noses, but it is a sweet scent to the Lord, not so much because of the physical scent of it, but because of what it represents in this complete devotion and sacrifice to Him. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and shall take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces and wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord, which literally translates to that which goes up in smoke. It is a pleasing aroma. There it is, a food offering to the Lord. So here we see food offering. And these ram offerings here are actually pretty obscure. Like I was trying to find a deeper meaning behind the ram. And I don't know, if you've got more info on that, let me know. But I didn't get a chance to actually dig deeper into that. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the great toes of their right feet and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Okay, so what is all of this symbolizing here? Well, remember, blood symbolizes life. And so putting the blood on the priests themselves is basically symbolizing that they are covered by the blood. The price is being paid to cover for their sins and debt. So this would have been known as what is an atonement. And they are going to be the ones to offer atonement for the entire nation of Israel once a year on the Day of Atonement. But atonement is simply a covering. It's not a complete washing away of sin. It is just to cover it temporarily. Now, when we look at where this was all placed, it was placed on their ear, their thumb, and their toes, and on the right side of their body. And so, I was thinking, okay, well, the right side we know symbolizes strength. All of their strength is sourced from God Himself. And when we look at the ear, well, the ear represents what they hear, right? And in the hearing of the words, perhaps it would be that this blood is strengthening their ability to hear the word on their thumbs, representing the fact that they will do work with their hands and be able to accomplish God's will, and then their toes representing their walk with God. So, their hearing, their work, and their walk all being dedicated to God, covered by God and by His strength. That was kind of my interpretation of it, a little bit mixed with some of the things that I read. So, give me your thoughts on that. I would love to hear more. I know some people get all bent out of shape whenever we start trying to find symbolic or spiritual meanings behind some of these things, but I think it's important for us to try. It isn't trying trying to dilute the word in any way, or it isn't even trying to add to it or take away. It's trying to understand God's heart behind what he did. And this is a good thing. We want to know our God. And so, I think he finds pleasure in us asking the questions and discussing it with each other, because that is ultimately building fellowship among believers. Just don't fight over it. Like, that's where things get a little bit dirty. And we don't want to be dirty here. We want to be clean. So, just be kind and loving whenever you decide to start discussing these kinds of things. But I think it's a good thing for us to, to do that. Verse 21, then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his son's garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his son's garments with him. So, this would be a second anointing in a sense. We had the blood anointing already and now we're going to have blood mixed with oil. And if you think about blood and oil, you can't help but think of Jesus on the cross as a sacrifice and the Holy Spirit representing that oil. So, this would speak of sacrifice and spirit or cleansing and empowerment. Verse 22, you shall also take the fat from the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination. And one loaf of bread and one cake of bread made with oil and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. You shall put all these on the palms of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma before the Lord. It is a food offering to the Lord. So here we see the wave offering being introduced. So typically in a wave offering, you wouldn't normally see them being burnt on the altar. This is one of 
of the only cases where we will see that. But what it signifies is that they are dedicating these things to the Lord by waving it in front of the altar. And then as they receive it now as this offering, it's God saying, okay, you have dedicated this gift to me, and now I am giving a portion of it back to you for provision. This was part of his way of providing for the priest. So everything belongs to him, but he gives it back to us as gifts. And you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved and the thigh of the priest's portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination, from what was Aaron's and his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel, for it is a contribution. It shall be a contribution from the people of Israel from their peace offerings, their contribution to the Lord. And by the way, I know you're starting to hear all these offerings and like, what in the world are all of these things? We will learn more about them in the book of Leviticus. So they're kind of just being shown to us here and we'll dig a little deeper later on. Verse 29, the holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him. They shall be anointed in them and ordained in them. The son who succeeds him as a priest, who comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place, shall wear them seven days. You shall take the ram of ordination and boil its flesh in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration, but an outsider shall not eat of them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh for the ordination or of the bread remain until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. So the entire sacrifice was to be burnt up, meaning no leftovers for morning. And this symbolized that they have basically failed in giving their all to God, and therefore the entire higher animal will do so in their place. But it didn't stop there. They would now commit to giving their all to the Lord from this point forward. And we hear this term thrown around all the time. I mean, in fact, we tell our kids every weekend before their wrestling match and their gymnastics competitions, give it your all. And that simply means give it your best effort, lay it all out on the mats, leave it there. That's all we care about is that you're trying your best. So heart check. Have you committed your all to the Lord? Are you laying it all down and leaving it at the altar? And if not, what's holding you back? Verse 35, thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days shall you ordain them. And every day you shall offer a bull as a sin offering for atonement. Also, you shall purify the altar when you make atonement for it and shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. So why are all of these things on repeat? Well, remember, anytime God repeats anything, that means there is mega importance to it. Pay attention. And also sacrifices, remember, are temporary. So they are going to have to do this over and over again to have that continual communion with God. So this would emphasize the need for their holiness and faithfulness to Him. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. I mean, can you imagine having to do this act of sacrifice both in the morning and in the evening over and over again? I mean, most of us are really good usually at one or the other. You know, we can bring our offering of devotion in either the morning or the evening hours. Which one is yours? I'm a morning person. I mean, I wake up at two and I love it, but by 5 p.m. I am like, donezo. So it depends if you are an early bird or like a night owl, but the full sacrifice comes whenever we can dedicate our entire day to the Lord, not just a one-time 35-minute video on YouTube. At the very least, as modeled here in the Bible, we should at least be devoting some part of our morning and our evening to Him. Now, I am going to be honest here. I don't do that. I try. I have put devotionals on my bedstand and have said, I'm going to start doing that at least, or at least say your prayers, you know, before you actually fall asleep and conk out. So it does doesn't need to be some religious ritual or anything like that. It can be simple, but it should at least close out your day. So heart check. Do you start and end your day with the Lord? 
And with the first lamb, a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hen, which would have been a quart of beaten oil and fourth of a hen of wine for a drink offering. So a drink offering symbolizes the pouring out or complete devotion once again. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight and shall offer with it a green offering and its drink offering as in the morning for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. And this just calmed my whole spirit as I was going through all of this stuff, trying to wrap my head around it. And I was like, oh, there it is. That's his whole purpose. He just wants to meet with his people and speak to them. So there I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So he ends this section with a reminder. He's bringing it all back and saying, but don't forget, I'm actually the one who sanctifies and consecrates and anoints and sets you apart and ordains you for service. You're going to do these things to meet me halfway, but your work in the end is really just to remove the barrier to allow me to be able to work among your people. So in the end, understanding the gravity of the role of the priest and all that was involved in their consecration and ordination really should make us truly appreciate what Jesus did even more, because we no longer need a representative to take all of our filth before a perfect God. You see, He was preparing the people for the day when they could have a direct relationship with Him through Jesus, which of course we're now partakers of. But not only that, He intentionally did all of this so that they would be so distinct from their surrounding pagan neighbors once they entered into the promised land. So there would be no, well, I didn't know, or I didn't mean to, because every single step of this process was so deliberate and required so much effort and concentration. And there was an emphasis on His holiness, something that we tend to treat so casually today. So heart check. How do you view God's holiness and how do you treat it? And diving a little bit deeper now, how does the responsibility of the priests translate to the responsibility that we have as a royal priesthood? How can we apply holy to the Lord to our lives? What would that look like? Look at what each piece of the garments represent in the Christian life today. What area might need repair? Does gaining a better understanding of the priesthood give you a greater appreciation for the work of Christ? So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending us the great high priest. Jesus, we recognize you today as the one who came with all authority and power, yet still chose to humbly serve and lay your life down on our behalf. Because you have done so, we no longer need anyone to intercede on our behalf. What a gift it is to know that when we enter into covenant with you, we are clothed with robes of righteousness and made whole. I pray that we too can understand our role as ministers who are indeed set apart for your glory. The way we wear our faith will either reflect or pollute your beauty in the eyes of others. And so I pray that we will wear it well. Forgive us, Lord, where we have taken those robes off and dishonored your holy name. I pray that we will understand the seriousness with which we approach our service to you. We don't ever want our worship to be diluted in any way. And we are so grateful to be chosen and called to honor you with our lives. And so I pray that we pay careful attention to everything we do so that we are always protecting that sacredness and holiness of the covenant. I pray that our minds are always girded with truth, with holy to the Lord being on our foreheads as well. But not only are we to live in external righteousness, but more importantly, with holy and righteous undergarments. We know you are more concerned with our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And so I pray that we will be as well, for true glory and beauty come from within. But this doesn't mean we neglect our outer appearance, for it's a gift as well. So I pray that we treat it as such, showing honor in the way that we present ourselves before you and people. 
Thank you for helping us to see the importance of living our lives in reverence. It isn't because you're an egotistical God, but it's because you are a perfect God who is holy and awesome and deserve nothing less than our complete devotion and worship. Forgive us, Lord, where we have treated it so casually or where we have taken your grace for granted. I pray that in reading this today, we have a better understanding of what Jesus did for us and why. Thank you for loving us and caring for us enough to put an end to our own failing ability to upkeep your ways. We know that we are saved by grace, washed and covered by the blood and anointed with your Holy Spirit, but that gives no excuse to live loosely or however we want. Your standard is a holy standard. It is unchanging. So we desire to do our best to live purely and holy before you. So thank you for dwelling among us today. What a powerful reminder it is of your love and grace and desire to be in continual relationship with us. I pray that we prepare a place for you morning and evening to meet with us. We love you so much and thank you for being with us here in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. And I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.